Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for uh, more coffee and philosophy. Uh, today I'm pleased to have joining us my friend Sheldon Richmond. In fact, I am wearing this t-shirt in honor of Sheldon. You can see this message. Uh, Sheldon is the one who introduced me to this quotation. And if we get a chance, we might talk about that guy uh, uh, later on. Uh, Sheldon has spent his career in the libertarian movement. He's, you know, he's known everyone from uh, Carl Hess and Murray Rothbard to Thomas Saz and uh, Dave Barry. He was formerly a newspaper reporter, uh, director of research at the Council for Competitive Economy, uh, senior editor of the Institute for Humane Studies, which I think is actually where I met you in or around 1987, uh, and a senior editor at the Cato Institute, which is likewise where I think I saw you again when uh, Brian Kaplan and I, I was, I was, uh, I was running the program that I had previously been you know, on the other end of at IHS and Brian Kaplan and I came over to uh, give you a visit. Senior editor of Inquiry Magazine, uh, for a long time editor of The Freeman, also known as Ideas on Liberty, depending on the year, for the Foundation for Economic Education vice president at and editor of the Future of Freedom magazine for the Future of Freedom Foundation. Currently, Sheldon is the executive editor at the Libertarian Institute, a research fellow at the Independent Institute, a senior advisor at the Molinari Institute, senior fellow uh, and chair of trustees at the Center for a Stateless Society. In addition to hundreds of articles, he has authored uh, the following books. Uh, with the Future of Freedom Foundation, he has three books. Separating School and State, How to Liberate America's Families. Your Money, uh, and that was in um, 1995. Your Money or Your Life, Why We Must Abolish the Income Tax from 1999. And Tethered Citizens, Time to Repeal the Welfare State from 2001. And uh, Sheldon is, fan of that, is a fan of that term, uh, tethered, uh, which also occurs on his website. Uh, with Griffin and Lash in 2016, he has America's Counter-Revolution, the Constitution Revisited. Most recently with the Libertarian Institute, he has Coming to Palestine from last year and What Social Animals Owe to Each Other from this year. He also has a couple of blogs, Free Association and The Logical Atheist. And in the description, I'll have the links to both of those. But if you happen to be watching this in, you know, in an embedded form, you'll feel like uh, going out of the embed to see the uh, the link. It's sheldonfreeassociation.blogspot.com and logical-atheist.blogspot.com. So in addition to his political interests, he has a, an economic interest. He has a wide variety of interests from Aristotle to atheism, from Gilbert Ryle to Gilbert and Sullivan. So I thought I'd just start by asking about your background where you grew up, how you got interested in uh, in libertarianism and involved in the uh, in the uh, libertarian movement. Well, great to be with you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I grew up in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, well, that's Philadelphia, and uh, that's the Philadelphia. There are a couple of Mississippi. At least in the United States, or a couple of those. Yeah, there's a pair. Uh, I, uh, there's a Florence in Alabama. What can I say? There's Paris everywhere. Uh, we'll always have Paris. It turns I out Paris am a, <laughs> I'm an early baby boomer. I was born in the during the at the end of the first year of Harry Truman's own presidential term, the one he won in 1948. Uh, just made it into that year. I was born the day after Christmas, 12.53 a.m. on Christmas, Christmas Day. <clears throat> so I, I was, uh, not that I experienced the Truman years, I wasn't much aware of things going on there. The first president I was aware of was Eisenhower, and I just thought he was always the president and always would be the president, and he's just kind of a fixture, which he was for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, my brought up in a middle-class Jewish background, conservative Jewish, which is that sort of that Today, the lines are all blurred, but kind of that in-between area be between the uh, Orthodox on one side and the Reform on the other side. It was an attempt to, they didn't like Orthodoxy, but they thought the Reform had gone too far. You know, they took Hebrew out of the services, and so they were trying to conserve something. 
something. So it's a it's a real in a way muddled <laughs> uh, a mixture of, of those two, two two things. That was moderate. Uh, I went through I went through uh, the Philadelphia public schools neighborhood schools. Could walk to every school I ever attended. Uh, from there, I went uh, where a lot of uh, students from my high school, which was called Northeast High School, uh, went because it was easy, easy to get in being in state was Temple University. I was sort of a, I was a mediocre student. I, I think of myself as having uh, sleepwalked through high school. I mean, I sort of remember it, but I, I, I don't think it had much impact on it. And I don't think it had much impact on, on me. Uh, and, uh, but when I, so I, I went to Temple and I did, I did, I did find a Temple. I enjoyed uh, Temple. Uh, unfortunately, I missed Walter Williams. I graduated in 71 and he didn't get there until 73. So I didn't know of him until later on. Uh, but I took a lot of philosophy, although I was a radio TV film major th and I had decided early on that I wanted to go into the uh, print media, the newspaper business. I was totally enamored with H.L. Mencken. I I just thought his life that he described in, in various writings was so uh, romantic. <laughs> uh, although he would probably scoff at such a thing that I would think that. Uh, but that's what I wanted to do. And so I did that. So my first career, as you say, was, uh, was as a new newspaper reporter. I started with a small paper outside of Philadelphia called the Coatesville Record, long gone. Coatesville was a steel town. Uh, and I did all kinds of things. It was a small paper. So you, you got to do everything. You covered the cops, you covered governments. Uh, and so I got, I was, I was already a libertarian, which I, I'll go back and talk about that in a second. But anyway, I got a really good education in observing the state. I also spent three years covering courts, criminal uh, and civil courts and the DA's office and the public defender's office. It was a great education, uh, especially as a libertarian. Now, it didn't make me a libertarian. I was already a libertarian. I became, a, I, my political awareness began, I think this is true of a lot of libertarians who are about my age I and mean, people I know. I could name some names, but uh, I guess I shouldn't. Uh, not that it's embarrassing, but the Barry Goldwater campaign was the beginning of my awareness. And that's because I had an older brother. Who unfortunately, uh, I died in 1998, so it's, it's been a long time. Uh, but he was uh, ahead of me and was off to college, went to Albright College, a pretty, uh, pretty good liberal arts school in Reading, Pennsylvania. And he was telling me about, he was really opening my eyes to politics. I hadn't thought anything about politics. Now, I was very interested in the, in the American Revolution. I liked stories about liberty and the revolution. I remember Johnny Tremaine. I, the, Disney had a series on TV about the Swamp Fox, played by Leslie Nielsen, who went on to do comedic roles later on, of course, Police Squad and, and, uh, and those things, Airplane. Something, Francis Marion, was that his name? Francis Marion, yes, Francis I always thought it was interesting that as a kid, I thought, huh, Francis Marion, that seems like a woman's name, but it's a guy. And Leslie Nielsen, that seems like a, a woman's name, but he is a guy. So, of course, I didn't know that there are male uh, uh, counterparts. Uh, so, I love that series. I just liked the idea of liberty. It just appealed to me, you know, automatically. I didn't, and then I read, I think I read the book about the Swamp Fox. I remember he was from South Carolina. He was kind of a guerrilla warrior. Uh, yeah, I, had a, I, mean, I, just, I had a collection of, well, I may still have it uh, on vinyl, a collection of... Uh, of uh, songs from the um, from the revolution, and there's one about the swamp fox. For we are yeah. Marion's men. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I ever heard that, but I did like that series. I don't know how long it was. Maybe going. on YouTube, never, if so, I'll put in the link. I never googled that to see if, you know how long that show ran. I real know. I never saw the show. Um, yeah, oh, I enjoyed it, uh, and so I was kind of primed. So my my brother was telling me about. Uh, about the Goldwater campaign, and he was he was not a libertarian, but you know, a mild conservative who was interested in Goldwater. Uh, he didn't like Johnson, you know, uh, uh, and he was maybe three years ahead of me, my my brother. So uh, uh, I read the Conscience of a Conservative. The funny thing is, I couldn't find a copy anywhere, free Amazon, <laughs> free internet, uh, and the only place I could find one finally, a paperback, was in a was at an American Opinion bookshop which was actually a wall at the back of a shoe repair, Joe's Shoe Repair. Uh, that's the name of it. I remember that very distinctly. The only, I don't know how I knew to go there. Somebody must have directed me. Anyway, I read that book. Uh, I wasn't thinking much about foreign policy in those days. 
I probably just would have been open to the idea that we have, yeah, we have to be strong in order to get those, you know, make sure the Russians don't take us over. And, and, but was, what was really appealing to me was what, what uh, uh, Goldwater was saying about uh, liberty and limits on government and you know, pro-free enterprise. That I found very appealing. Uh, and I guess I was talking to people in school about this. And two guys who were twins, and I remember their names, I, I haven't heard from them since, said something to me like, if you like that, and this is the way it starts, right? If you like that book, you really need to read Henry Hazlitt's Economic Legal Lust. So I said, okay, thanks. And then I'm sure I went out and got the book, but they might've said to me, send your name to the Foundation for Economic Education, which I never heard of. Interestingly, many years later, I'd become the editor. And that was the longest job I ever held, right? For the longest period of time, 15 years. Like 15 years, yeah. Everything else was like five years. <laughs> three years. Uh, and they said to me, once your name was on the list, it'll be there forever and it won't cost anything. So just send your name in. They'll start sending it as Freeman. Which that was true for a very long time. Yeah. yeah. In those days it was little. Yeah. Leonard Reed didn't believe in uh, knocking people off. Uh, yeah. No, I got it. In, in any respect. When I was in high school. My friend, my, uh, you know, there was a friend in church who, who, who put our names on that list. And so we got, um, you know, we got the little the little Freemans from uh, Freemans. Is that the right way to say it? I guess from uh, you know from Fee. He also put us. On, see, he also put I, us on the see, from the list from Hillsdale, which is less less delightful. But you know, I kept seeing the letters fee, thinking, do I have to pay money? Is there is, a, is there a fee? <laughs> it took me a second to figure out <laughs> what that meant. No, this is still high school, by the way. So either they or somebody else said, well, if you like that. You know, there's this guy, Mises, you start hearing names, Rothbard, and then someone said, you got to read Atlas Shrugged. And that's, that's going to be inevitable, at least in, 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 my, uh, uh, in my time, at least. So I think I read The Fountainhead first, and I really liked it. Now, that wasn't very, there's not politics really in there. Uh, and, uh, but then I went on to Atlas Shrugged, and, uh, and then I started Temple. Yeah. I went to Temple and I, I met students of objectivism, as we called ourselves uh, back then, of uh, various uh, orthodoxies, some more tolerant than, <laughs> than others. But we ended up as uh, remains uh, the case. Uh, you know, forming a group, forming a group. In the meantime, I had fallen in with a, a, a really rough crowd, namely the old society. Sorry. This was when there was still a libertarian caucus of YAF. We're talking now 1968, 69. And I somehow met, these are names out of the past, Don Ernsberger, David Walter, and then there were a few others. They, they were based in Philadelphia. One, uh, one I think I actually teacher. met Don Ernsberger much later. Uh, at the, you know, like at the, maybe around 2000. No, it wouldn't have been 2000. He was in, he had gone to D.C. later. Yeah, it was when they, yeah, he later went to work for the Don, one he later went to work for I've been to, I think it was 96. He later went to work for Dana Rohrbacher, who I met in the era I'm now talking about. Okay, so I, I get in with this crowd. They had a little office in Philadelphia, so I'd go down there after school and hang out. And I was reading, oh, Filthy Pierre's uh, Libertarian. I used to get that. The, uh, the, the, the little, little, little crap things stapled together. Yeah. Mimi yeah, like a Mimeo, and you could guarantee to have an article published to send them the stencil. That's what you needed to do. I don't know who he was, filthy fear. <laughs> uh, but I was reading people like Stephen Holbrook, who I you know came to know later on, associated with the uh, Independent Institute. Uh, and we were very, very serious. We went off to the, the Pocono Mountains like for weekend retreats and had training programs and how to speak. I mean, this is kind of, you know, this is kind of cult thing we were doing, right? How, how to give a decent speech and, and then we would speak and they would evaluate us and it was just honing our skills. It was really very good. And, you know, they, you know, very small budget. It wasn't a big thing, but we became the part of the Libertarian Caucus of YAF. So in, as part of that, in early 1969, I went to New York for, there was a regional conference, regional, you know, convention, I guess, of YAF. And I, I think well, I was only went off a member of YAF too later on, believe it or not. Well, I joined because, you know, in those days, I didn't, this was before I even knew the word libertarian. And, you know, it seemed like the only game in the town. I wasn't a commie, right? I wasn't a state socialist and that, so that didn't appeal to me. 
so we went to New York, a bunch of us from SI, sorry, we're still, we're still the Libertarian Caucus, I'm getting ahead. ahead. Uh, and to see a debate between Carl Hess and Jerome Tuchili, who's the father of J.D. Tuchili of Reason Magazine. Uh, he was a libertarian, limited government guy. Hess was arguing for anarchism, and they debated. Now, I don't remember really the debate, and I couldn't tell you what people were saying. It's probably predictable stuff. I do remember hearing later, though, that after the debate, Tuchili went over to Hess and said, you win, I'm convinced. And later he wrote that book, uh, what was the book he wrote? Radical Libertarianism, I forget it, although it had the word. Yeah, right it's Radical Libertarianism, book. and the subtitles, I think, is a right-wing perspective, which is unfortunate. Yeah. But yeah, but that's because- Well, that's later, the, later on, fairly, Carl Hess- Fairly lefty. Yes, and la but later on, Carl Hess wrote Capitalism for Kids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> and that was way late, way later. Oh, well, uh, as Hobbes, so, you know, so, uh, Words are like uh, counters, uh, you know, fools use them as money and wise men use them as counters. He said it better than I did. One thing I like is he really has a way with, with words, even if, you know, he doesn't always put them together into true sentences. But I like that line of his. So I, uh, I didn't meet Carl Hess on, on that occasion. I mean, I watched, I was in the audience. But the significant thing for me uh, from, that, from that day was that, uh, Sitting in a back row were three people that were then pointed out to me who would become quite, uh, you know, loom large in my life after that. Uh, Walter Block, Mario Rizzo, and Murray Rothbard. And someone said, that's Murray Rothbard back there. And I, I maybe knew the name by then. I don't know how, if I'd read anything. I'd probably read it. The, oh, so the Austrian Mafia system. in the background some of the short, and they were cackling back there at, at what the two children were saying. I guess. Yeah. Anyway, it was, it was, that's a, that was a big thing in my life, right? Big, big time. So later that year was the national convention in St. Louis, the famous national convention in St. Louis of YAF. And we fielded a, 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 a list of board members to, to we, that we hoped would get elected. Uh, we, did, we didn't challenge the guy running for president, it was a guy named David McKay. Uh, I guess we felt we weren't going to beat him anyway, and he wasn't so bad, so let's not do that. So we didn't try to find anybody. And so we went, and we took, I remember taking a, uh, a Greyhound a bus with a bunch of people from the Philadelphia area, 19 hours in the, on the bus, and I was sitting next to, a, who was a friend of mine in these day, those days, I was sitting next to Bob Bidnato, a name you know. On that bus ride, Bob Bidnato read his open letter to Ayn Rand, where he made the case for anarchism, which later on- Are you sure you don't mean Roy Childs? No, no, I didn't meet Roy Childs yet. He so acknowledged that Roy Childs at all. He, at that point he was, and he wrote an open letter to, I don't know if it was an open, I guess it was an open letter. Yeah. Oh, because the only open letter I knew uh, was, was Roy Childs' one. I had no idea. I don't know, I don't know where, Even though utterly I don't know where he published it. Otto is to anarchism these days, I didn't know he had this- Oh yes, exactly. Dark and dark. And we were, in, the, in those days, we were very good friends. In recent years, he's attacked me as a sympathizer of terrorism. So yeah, well, I, talk about him I, I and my friends he, have been attacked likewise. <laughs> he did acknowledge that Roy Childs had already written an open letter to Ayn Rand on, and his letter was, as I recall, was very much like, like Roy's letter, but he wanted to have his own letter uh, and put it on the record with Ayn Rand and get canceled, I guess, for, in his subscription, which is what happened <laughs> to Roy. Uh, anyway, we get we get to uh, St. Louis. I've never seen that online anywhere. Exciting. Probably because the only person who put it online would be him, and he would not do so. Yeah, <laughs> I never, I never even looked for, it. I never even looked for it. Uh, but uh, we, um, so we get to St. Louis, and it's it's terribly exciting. And I'll, I'll make a you know a long story less long. Um, I did get to see Carl Hess. I met Dan Rohrbacher, who in those days was not a was not a, a button-down conservative, but a, a hippie, hippie of the right, let's say. He was a, a libertarian. libertarian no, that's how David Friedman describes him, right? Stone, stoner, sorry, what'd you say? A libertarian I troubadour, guess, I think is how David Friedman describes Troubadour, him. had his guitar, sat under, we sat under the uh, uh, gateway, gateway arch, and uh, listened to him play. Uh, Carl Hess made a famous appearance, under, famous for libertarians, under the gateway arch and gave, gave a talk and, uh, uh, he was, Carl Hess was always very relaxed. I later on became friends with him. And uh, a guy 
Bill, named Bill Schumacher, who burned his draft card in the uh, convention hall, was beaten up by some uh, ex-Marines who were yaffers. <laughs> uh, and our slate for the board got totally smashed. Uh, meanwhile, Murray Rothbard had brought out a special edition of the Libertarian Forum that said, you know, listen, yaff. And it was really a message to the Libertarians. Get out of there. Don't try to elect people. And that, on that, that was the end of the Libertarian Caucus and the formation of the Society for Individual Liberty, SIL, which later joined up at the Libertarian International and became the International Society for Individual Liberty with the unfortunate initials ISIL yeah. later. I guess it's, now, it's, now they're going, calling themselves Liberty International. So they're- Yeah, I think I, I've seen they, you know, And so uh, that was- names. At least they have more justification that was the, for changing their name than, um, uh, than, than David Kelly's outfit has. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I yeah. guess the- the similarity to ISIL is, but I also have, you know, in case of ISIL, it's the other one that should change the name. They're the only, actually, you know, during World War II, <laughs> there was an American soldier, his last name was Hitler. And people asked him, are you gonna change the name? <laughs> Hell no, I'm not the one bringing the space in the family. It's the guy in Germany. He's the one who should change his name. <laughs> so Canada and his family eventually did change, change the name to something other than Hitler. <laughs> So we went, we went back, uh, you know, back home to Philadelphia and started up our, our own independent organization. And, and they held some great conferences in those days. So 69 and 70, that's where I got to see David Friedman speak. I saw Eric Mack speak. These are people I'm seeing for the first time. Uh, Tibor McCann. Uh, and I met Mises in that context, even though he never got to speak because of screw up and scheduling, it was really a shame. It was 1970, he died in 73, he was a little frail, but they brought him down with, with Margaret, his wife from New York on, a, on the train. But while he was sitting outside the hall waiting to uh, give his talk, he started just talking about the dangers of inflation. And you, he had this big group of students around him sitting at his feet. And I was one of them, listening to him talk very so kind of softly, no microphone about just the ravages that inflation can inflict on a society. My one and only contact with, uh, with uh, Mises. I, I saw just and then finally the met It wasn't quite, quite the way they intended. So, so do you I want said, to explain so what happened? So we did sort of get to speak at the conference, even if it- Yeah, right, not the way he, got, he intended. Actually, what happened was they had, they had uh, scheduled, overscheduled or had a problem and he had the, he was waiting for David Friedman to finish his talk, but he was very upset that he had to wait for a Friedman. So that's, you know, it wasn't the best PR for SIL, unfortunately, but those were great conferences. They put them on a pen and a few different places, University of Pennsylvania. And then, you know, I went back to Temple, finished my studies and, and we had an active libertarian group. I wrote a call, weekly column for the, uh, the student paper. Uh, about libertarianism, and yeah, we had great fun. Uh, I met Jerry Rubin. He wasn't too fond of seeing me because I, I forget what I was saying to him, but I but I, I didn't have the impression Jerry Rubin was really a libertarian. Maybe he hasn't. If you he wasn't a Carl Oglesby as far as I was concerned. Anyway, it was a great great time. So from there, I went into the newspaper business, and I already kind of talked about that. Uh, I spent a little time at the Associated Press, not very long, I didn't really like it there. And then I went on to the, uh, after covering the courts for three years, went on to the larger paper, the Wilmington, uh, Delaware News Journal, where I covered uh, the state legislature, city council, again, more education in the state up close, politicians up close. While I was covering school boards and town councils in uh, Pennsylvania, I would be sitting next to the reporter from a, uh, the competing paper, we were kind of the Brandex little paper. He was the big paper in the county, Chester County, Pennsylvania. And he would sit, we'd sit in the back and he'd make all these kind of snide, very, very uh, worthwhile, but snide sarcastic remarks about what he was seeing up there on the stage. You know, just to me, not out loud. Uh, and I'd laugh and I would make some libertarian points back, but he was never making any kind of affirmative statements, right? It was all, it was just mocking, which was, which was great. But uh, that was Dave Barry. We became very good friends. The famous Dave Barry, Pulitzer Prize winner, once had a TV show based on him, starring uh, Harry Anderson. Of yeah, I, I actually uh, saw so best-selling best-selling uh, author, including best-selling novelist. He has at least one best-selling novel. 
Uh, and so we became good friends and uh, spent a lot of time together, but we'd argue about politics, always friendly. He, he was, I think, you know, he tended to be, you'd say, you know, slightly left of center. So he didn't like the conservatives, uh, but mostly he was interested in humor and, and sarcasm. Uh, we then went our separate ways. I went to Delaware, he, he was not working for the paper anymore. But when I decided I didn't want to do any more reporting, I got tired of that straitjacket. I took reporting seriously that the reporter should be detached from his story and try to fairly present whatever it is he's reporting on him. And I really did take that seriously. It seems not to be taken too seriously these days. And then I found that constraining. I wanted to get into advocacy. I knew there were libertarian groups starting up, right? Cato begins in 1977. Things are beginning to happen. I remember writing a letter to Mario Rizzo, who was in NYU, and he, there was some institute or something connected with NYU that he was interested in. And I, I, don't, I, I guess I had just read something of his, so I wrote to him and just said, is there some way I'm become involved? Well, I wasn't an academic. I didn't have a career, a, a, a degree beyond a Bachelor of Science. Or bachelor, bachelor of Work. I forget what I had now. It was radio, TV, film. You think it would be arts, but I actually think it was science. Uh, who knows well, it's sort of, well, you know, it's sort of on the intersection of the two. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so he wrote and suggested I write to the Cato Institute, which was very helpful. Later on, you know, we became kind of friends. I mean, it's not somebody I see on a frequent basis. He's in New York, and I was I was never based in New York. Uh, and and so um, I I got tired of reporting, but I, and I wasn't sure where to go from there. Uh, and so Dave Barry, who was had left reporting and was was teaching writing, effective writing for a consulting firm that would set up seminars in companies, corporations, companies, you know, Allied Chemical, DuPont, places like that. Uh, he, and he said, I must've been talking to him. He said, uh, how would you like to do that? So I got, he went, he put me through training real, real fast. And uh, there was a textbook that the founder of this little uh, consulting company had written and, and I liked it. And, uh, and so I did that for a year. I wasn't working side by side with Dave. We were in different places. Uh, but that was, those, that was a very important year because I honed my editing skills. I really do attribute what, what I think is you know, pretty fair uh, ability at editing uh, to that year. Because there's, no, there's nothing like, and I also probably improved my writing too, but I mean, editing other people. Th these were technical people who didn't know how to write plain English. These were not illiterate people. These were chemists who had to communicate to salespeople who were not chemists what it is, the pro you know, what the product was. And they had a hard time doing it. So my job was to teach them how to, uh, how to do that. There was writing, uh, editing workshops. It was, it was very good. Uh, but then as that year was coming to a close, I got a call saying, how would you like to come down to Washington and be director of research at the Council for a Competitive Economy, which was intended to be, it was one of the early Koch organizations, so I can say that, say that name. I use that four-letter four word. <laughs> uh, Cato had already started, so it wasn't the first, wasn't the first of the Koch organizations. But the, the idea was to be, we're going to build a libertarian, really libertarian chamber of commerce, kind of the chamber of commerce. Uh, so I went down and spent the summer on tr just to try it out, see if I liked it. And I did like it. And then in the fall, I moved down there and, and, and joined the staff. We fought tariffs. We fought subsidies. The first big fight was against Lee Iacocca's Chrysler bailout that he was trying to get from Jimmy Carter. We lost that one, of course. He got the, he got the bailout. But we placed, you know, Washington Post full page ads saying no bailout. Everything big business liked, we, we opposed. And uh, it was a good, it was a fun few years. Uh, from there, I went to Inquiry Magazine and then that closed. So if, I don't know if it was me, everywhere I go, there's a problem. <laughs> but Inquiry Magazine was a great magazine. Uh, it was, a, it used to be called the, like the best of the left and right because those were the categories everybody thought of. So you had Murray Rothbard and Noam Chomsky regularly and Matt Hentoff writing regularly about for the First Amendment. And it was great. You had left, uh, new left historian. You actually said during one of his periods, you know, some people sort of will often alternate between, you know, disparaging and friendly remarks about libertarianism. And somebody oh, said, yeah. you know, you know, libertarianism was awful and horrible, but, you know, in fairness, you know, I really respect their commitment to rational argumentation. And for yeah. a long time, the only places I could get published were in some of their journals. And so that's probably one of the ones yeah. they had in mind. Yeah, and inquiry is filled with names like that. Sidney Lenz, you know, who was a Cold War revisionist. 
uh, lots of people. And on the economic side, it was Rothbard and, and the, the younger Austrians, uh, Jerry O'Driscoll, Rizzo probably. Ralph Rako was book editor, the book editor. Uh, and he was very good at that. My old friend, Ralph Rako, great, great historian and very, very fine person. I think I met him uh, the same summer I met you at IHS. Probably right. He spent a year at IHS once I got to IHS and that was great because I got to spend time with him, mm -hmm. a lot of time with him. Uh, from there, I went to, uh, I don't know if I have the order right now, from uh, in Inquiry Finding Closed, which is make, losing too much money. And it closed in 1994. I went to work for a thing that, uh, that the CC, the Council for Competitive Economy had morphed into called Citizens for a Sound Economy, which was no longer oriented just getting businessmen to join, but, but it was going to be like a grassroots thing. So I did a few years of that uh, editing and writing papers just on public policy, honing, honing my skills, I think. And then I went to, then I, but after a couple of years there, I was uh, tired of that. And, and that's when IHS was moving from California to George Mason. And I was living in that area, in the Fairfax County area of, uh, in Virginia. And I uh, wrote to John Bondell and said, who was president at the time, the late John Bondell, uh, do you, uh, are you hiring anybody on this end? And he said, uh, well, I think so. And so I got hired as senior editor. I was there the day the moving van pulled in to the to Mason, to the to Tollwood House. Tollwood House. Tollwood House the, I, I have to call it written down. It's been, it's, it's since been torn down, alas, but it was very uh, Right, and it wasn't contiguous with the campus, actually. It was campus property, but it was- No, it was a long island. walk. I think, I think on one of those long yeah. walks through the, um, you know, through the Virginia summer heat, uh, it was when Ralph Rako said, yeah. no one told me we were going to be reenacting the Bataan Death March. <laughs> And I'm, my office was never in Tollwood House. Remember, there was also a bunker, like a one-story long. Oh, I remember there was another. I didn't. I didn't think it, it had. Was bunker, but I remember, several, there, I remember several several the building because we all went to talk. We were all the all the, the graduate fellows went to talk with you about our our papers we were working on. Yeah, and I remember. Yeah, you were. Oh yeah, that's right. I got to do. I got to do some editing there, and I, 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 that was a very important time for me. I mean, I hope people gained from. Uh, talking to me, I mean, but I gained a whole lot from all the people that passed through that. The, the summer fellows, the postdoctoral fellows, I got to know Emilio Pacheco spent the, for my first year there, and then Chandra and uh, Kukitsis. Uh, yeah, that's when Mayer. I was writing my, my first published paper, not counting a book review that I may have been earlier, but my first published paper on Mill uh, was during ah. the, that summer of... Um, and I got to read, I got to read a lot of that kind of stuff from you folks and offer editorial suggestions. Now, I wasn't really a real, I wasn't offering uh, substantive suggestions because I hadn't read, I'd read only a fraction of the stuff you, you guys had read, but I was learning from you guys all the time. And, and plus we'd have set, we'd have these little seminars, uh, what did uh, John Blundell call them, uh, brown bag seminars. You bring your lunch, you know, to the library, which is a kind of this big open room. I remember and, Catherine Balk and then saying that you corrected all her IFFs to IF because you thought it was just a mis uh, mistake because she was a native French speaker. <laughs> wow, that's embarrassing. I hope I didn't do that. I don't remember that, but I, uh, I think by well, you I know, if know someone without a background <laughs> in, in analytic philosophy uh, yet, and uh, reading someone you know is not a native English speaker, <laughs> it's not that surprising. You might think that the mistake is going on there. Um, but that's one of the most important mistake, periods. Unlikely to make today. <laughs> I, I was there for five years. And to me, that was one of the most fruitful periods, just because of all the people I got to have some contact with. Plus, we would bring in speakers. Uh, Peter Bauer, who I got to know. Uh, Thomas Sowell, who I didn't get to know, but I think he's probably a hard person to get to know. But anyway, he was there and he got to hear him speak. Uh, lots of other people. Plus, I got to meet and talk to Gordon Tullock, who always had something to say about everything and knows, knows at least something about everything, knew something about everything. James Buchanan, and then all the younger people, Don Boudreau, uh, Pete Betke, Steve Horwitz, uh, all those students, Dave Pachitko, so many, I mean, I could just go on and on, who were in the graduate program at Mason. It was just, I couldn't have asked for like a better time to be dr just dropped into IHS. I mean, that was a great move on my part because I didn't know how great it was going to be. Uh, at this time, I was also writing, just to throw this out, I was writing for a, a column for the Washington Times. I wasn't on the staff, but I was writing as an outsider, a weekly column on computer, uh, 
personal computers and software as an end user, right? Not a technical column. Uh, I just wrote him one day and said, I see, I, don't, I see you don't have your column anymore. Would you be interested in uh, having me do it? And so they let me do it for like $25 a column, but, but in a sense, all the software I could eat. I could, I could write to companies and say, I'm the columnist. And every day was Christmas, you know, UPS would have left stacks of boxes, sometimes hardware too. Anyway, I did that for six years until the industry was just out of my control. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't keep up. So I finally gave that up. Uh, so what did I do after that? From there, I went to Cato after IHS and spent five years at Cato. Was there when, the, when they made the transition from Waterston House, that house that once housed Jefferson's core library that became, well, became the core of the uh, Library of Congress, uh, and then to when uh, Cato built its own building. At, yeah, and I've, I visited house. you, uh, Brian Kaplan and I visited you um, in that new building when it was, it was very new. Uh, I remember, in fact, I remember sitting in your office and you were on the phone. You had to take a phone call from some donor and you were trying to explain what the ideology of Cato was. And you're saying, well, it's market liberal. Sometimes you hear the word libertarian. <laughs> so Brian and I were chuckling about that sort of soft peddling. Uh, you have a good memory. I don't remember that one either. <laughs> uh, I'm not denying it, but uh, I, don't, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, it was this gleaming building with the glass front. It was quite- It is a cool looking building. Now they've gone- yeah, I've gone way I've, beyond I've that. Been, I've been another, back there a couple other building. things. Uh, I had a friend yeah, who- was, I've been back there since. I had a student who was an intern um, uh, there. And so back in 2001, I, uh, I, you know, I, I got to, to visit the building when, you know, when uh, it was closed. So uh, I got to meet, again, met lots of good people there. I, I was on very good terms with Bill Niskanen, who was very supportive of me when I came under fire for my writings about the Middle East back then. He, and also when I had this big piece in the Wall Street Journal about Reagan's horrible trade record uh, and got attacked by Clayton Yeiter, who was his trade representative. Uh, and, and of course, Bill knew all these people, right? Because of his, his experience in the uh, Council of Economic Advisors and, and everything else. He came to my defense beautifully and said, uh, what are you talking about? Reagan is the most protectionist president since Herbert Hoover. And uh, so I have fond memories of Bill. Uh, uh, and just, yeah, just had a great time dealing with people day, day to day, the staff, but also people who were coming through and it was always people coming through to speak. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the story until I ended up at Fee, although I never was based in uh, at Fee. It was always a telecommuter. Don Boudreaux became president of Fee in, in uh, 1998, I think it was, seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And uh, he tells me that the first, and I knew him really well from my days at Mason. He told me the uh, first thing he did was decide that he wanted me to be the editor. And that, so I said, well, do I need to move up there? And he said, no, that's fine. But I went up frequently. Yeah, well, it was, was a great improvement in the Freeman because the, the Freeman had taken a, a, a kind of a creepy social conservative turn before your arrival there. Yes, it did. Uh, I remember you know, stuff true. About, about how natural, uh, how natural and appropriate it is to feel hostility toward, toward gays and, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, so. it, you know, there were some of the shorter, uh, short term editors. You know, there was never really a successor to Paul Perot, who was an editor probably for 35 years, sometimes uncredited. In the beginning, his name, I don't think his name was one. And then when Leonard Reed died, you know, there was no, Leonard had no designated successor, so it kind of was in chaos. And people actually proposed that maybe Fee should just close at this point. Reed's gone. It was so much of a personal thing. People were devoted to Leonard Reed, right, donors and, and, and others. And... Uh, but no, it carried on and it was very chaotic and it was in very bad financial straits. But Don, so Don took the job. He decided he, he had been at the, he had left Mason to get a law degree at uh, Clemson because he wanted to do law and economics. And then I think it was at Clemson when he got the offer and he decided he wanted to leave academia and he thought running fee would be fun. He wanted a, he wanted a perch from which to speak and write. That's really what he loves doing. And he just thought this would be great. Uh, and he thought of me right away, and uh, we ca easily came to terms, and uh, he was not interested in the social conservatism, the stuff you were just referring to. He's a hardcore libertarian, and loves Bastiat, and free trade, and, you know, and was uh, essentially an anarchist. 
I mean, he talked, he actually talked about it in print. I mean, he was asked, he did a column of just asking questions, all of which, the direction of which was quite clear, you know, where, where he was going. With it. So that was a great time. He's one of the best people I ever worked for. Uh, but then I went through a whole bunch of presidents. There was a lot of turnover after Don decided to go back to school. I think he went back to Clemson to teach. Uh, or maybe he go to Mason at that point, I forget. Uh, and so and you, I was there. You, you were in attendance when, you know, I think uh, when I, uh, when I made it out to uh, uh, to Fee back when they were located uh, in Irvington and Hudson uh, for a yeah. conference that I spoke at, um, and uh, I remember you were there uh, again. Yes, that yeah. was probably the best in in my years there. That was the best summer of conferences. We did a lot of these student seminars. Uh, we would do five or six a summer. It was quite an elaborate program for fee. That summer, we had an executive director by the name of Lee Curry, and he was so encouraging to the people. I remember, yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Lee was the guy that organized it, and with some of my help. I don't know if you know Jeffrey Lee. Yeah. An economist who teaches, I forget where he yeah, teaches. I remember somewhere both. in Virginia. But he had been there as a, uh, I don't know, first an intern and then some staff member. And when Lee Curry came along as the executive director, he was a very nice guy and very supportive of me. I mean, the most supportive president for me since Don Boudreau. There were a few in between there who I got nothing out of, nothing, no help from. Uh, and so uh, I won't say any more about that. But Lee was all, he appreciated the magazine. He, he liked me. He liked Jeffrey. And he gave Jeffrey free hand to set up a series of seminars. And I was there to give advice and to suggest speakers, but he did the work. And we had you, I guess that's the first time. Was that the one and only feet seminar you ever spoke at? I, I'm trying to remember whether I was, whether I went up there once or twice, and I can't remember. I think in my time, that would have been the only time. But I that summer it was also. Once. I mean, there's a little part of me that thinks yeah. it was twice, but mostly I think it was just once. Because, you know, because you know, I took the, you know, I took the train up from Man Manhattan because I wanted to, to spend one day in Manhattan, um, or at least yeah. half a day in Manhattan. I remember that. You know, uh, between checking out of my uh, hotel and uh, and getting on the train for free, I I ran through the you know through the Metro Metropolitan Museum of Art for like you know ninety a ninety <laughs> minute uh, gulp, which was inadequate, but it was all I had. And I, I found a place that would store my luggage, which was nice. Um, <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, that was that was and that was a lovely. Um, of course, that was well, a, probably... again like Tallwood House. It was a lovely house with. Um, yeah, uh, and really, really cool uh, letters on the walls. I remember there was a letter on the wall from from Leon Trotsky to Henry Hazlitt. Yeah, back when. Uh, um, I, I, that's right. I can't remember what the subject of the letter was, uh, but it was just it was a cool thing. Yeah, I don't remember now either. Uh, I read it many times, uh, but I might have been the one who recommended you to Jeffrey, although he might have thought of it on his own. But the Brian Kaplan was there that yeah. summer. And I forget who else. It was an all-star cast. It was just magnificent. I had such a good time. Plenty of economists, of course. Ben Powell might have been there. Uh, Ed Stringham, I think, was there. I don't know if Jeffrey Hummel was there. That's possible. Anyway, yeah, I, I say all-star. It was the I'll best. Be after a while, <laughs> it was the most. Kersner was probably there because Kersner was a regular at those things. Kersner was always very close to the, the foundation. He'd been on the board for a while. I mean, I'm, I'm and not. I, and I got to know Israel Kersner very much. The only time I remember, it was my, my very first time at IHS is the only time I can definitely remember encountering Kersner. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know, back in you know, when I was at the Liberty Society week long thing in '86, uh -huh. I'm not sure I've encountered Kersner since then. But I'm not sure I haven't either. My my memory is not as uh, copious as it used to be. <laughs> well, those summer seminars were great too. I mean, I met. Lots of great people there because George Smith was one of the regulars. Uh, you know, my first, you know, my first living society had had uh, Leonard Liggio, George Smith, Randy Barnett, uh, Don Lavoy, uh, Israel Kersner. Oh yeah, I knew Don. And I forget who else. It was a, it was a. Uh, I knew Don well. Brain feast. In fact, when my first child was born, Jennifer, in 1983. Don and Mary. Don unfortunately died way too young. Great, great guy and great thinker, very important person, what a loss. Uh, he and Mary offered 
just a few weeks in, I think they hadn't had their first kid yet. I think this was part of the reason they asked to do this. They offered to babysit for an evening just so my wife and I could go out. It would have been the first time out since having the baby. I mean, she was a very young baby. And of course, we knew them and had no hesitation about that. And I think they also wanted to see what it would be like for us to be alone with an infant. Do we, do we want to have a baby? And I guess yeah, it's a good, a good that, trial run on someone else's kid, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and everything, everything was fine. I mean, my baby was, I think her first word was hermeneutics. At least it sounded like that. I can't swear that's what it was. But there were Gadamer. I think she was saying Gadamer, uh, something like that. Uh, Gadamer, Gaga, they sound very similar. Maybe, uh, okay, I, I'm probably over-interpreting Gaga. Uh, and Lady Gaga. It was, a, it was a musical request, actually. We hadn't heard of Lady Gaga yet, so I couldn't assume it was, it was that. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I mean, what can I say? I, I had the privilege and honor of meeting so many of these people and got, getting to spend time with. Thomas Sass is another one I got to know very well. I started, I published him at the Freeman. I brought him on as a columnist, uh, which lots of people didn't understand. I was once asked, why are we publishing a column about psychology? Now, at the time, the president was very big on promoting the idea of character. You may know who I'm talking about. But it didn't occur to me to say at the time, and I should have, you know, it's really not about psychology. It's about self-responsibility. And as I, as I recall, self-responsibility is a big part of character, which is what Tom was about, right? Self-responsibility and not the... Uh, uh, b blaming, uh, yeah. but also you know reported, another reported illness. He, you know, he was about was about you know not locking people up for dubious reasons, and that seems well like that too, the, which he which he of course wrote about. And he was a he was a wonderful guy, extremely charming, old world type. You know, born in Hungary, came over in 1918. Uh, sorry, when he was sorry, not 1918. He was born in 26, 20. Uh, came over at age 18. By the way, I have a video of an interview I did with him, which people can find on uh, my YouTube channel. Uh, the one that has politics in the name, because I have another YouTube channel about pipe smoking, which reminds me, you know. Oh, yes, yes. So, I so I the viewers are you, very talking about pipe. I wanted to show you my wizard pipe. pipe. My wizard pipe, my Gandalf pipe, which uh, is quite nice. Uh, I don't have anything in it at the moment. And only tobacco touches this, this pipe. I, I it's like one of my earlier videos, I actually, I, you know, I actually did it with a coffee mug. It didn't have any coffee in it, uh, but I, but I confess, uh, I confess, I, you know, I want to limit the amount of deception in doing these things. So I confess that I was doing it without, and I did one of these videos with coffee that had been heated up from the, from the night before, which is very sinful. But uh, uh, I think I really it, it reminded me of uh, my old colleague William Davis, who used to, uh, uh, who would leave his coffee. Um, uh, in the fridge and then uh, at the office on Friday and then on uh, on uh, Monday morning he'd you know, heat it up in the microwave and he says this is just as good as espresso and we'd all look at him with horror and <laughs> <laughs> anyway I can't say uh, I can't say too much about Tom I think he's the most maybe the most underrated libertarian 20th century libertarian I think a lot of people don't even bother to read him if they know about him because they think, well, that's just some esoteric area of psychiatry. You know, I'm not interested in that. They don't seem to realize all the violations of liberty uh, that occur in the name of uh, in the name of psychiatry and mental health and the therapeutic state, as he calls it. Uh, he's extremely important. He was, you know, he had been a crusader for getting rid of the drug war from very early on, and he was a con constantly condemning the psychiatric uh, 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 profession for listing homosexuality in its Bible of diseases. I mean, he wrote about that often and, and wrote aphorisms about it and pieces about it. And then finally they quote, voted it off the list in the seventies. That's, that's how they decide what, what's a disease and what's not a disease. I don't think they do that on the pure medical side where they take <laughs> a vote of hands. Is this a disease or not? Uh, and of course, we had. I, I used to sign one of his books. I forget which one. Uh, back when I used to teach medical ethics, um, it was probably the oh, middle yeah. illness. Uh, the one most likely. His to... books are great. I recommend uh, pick up almost anything. I mean, the, his magnum opus is, is, I think, is considered uh, insanity. Uh, oh, what's the subtitle now? Well, I'll look anyway, it up. It'll be, it'll be in the. In it's the, like analysis of an idea or something like that. I'll, I'll also have. 
I'll also have an image appearing, you know, in a ghostly way yes. between your head and mine. Of it's the funny, in the beginning, I kept waiting for my book covers to show up. It didn't <laughs> occur to me, wait a second, that's added later. <laughs> yeah, that will be added later. So please, if I have one, if I leave, leave the viewers one message, read some Thomas Saas. He's very important. I did an article in the Journal of Ayn Rand Studies uh, called uh, Sass and Rand. And it's about a, about a book that uh, uh, Sass wrote called Faith and Freedom, which is about libertarian, libertarian people. And, uh, and he does a chapter, he has a chapter on Rand and a chapter on Brandon, which are, I think, eye-opening chapters, very important. And he has a very important chapter about Deirdre McCloskey based on Deirdre's own book, Passing, about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, becoming a, tra a transgender woman. It's interesting to see what he has to say about Brandon. It's extremely both, interesting. You know, they're both, uh, you know, both psychologists. And I haven't read what he has to say about Brandon. I'd, I'd be interested to see that. Yeah. Well, look up that article. I read, I really read it recently. And it's been a while since I wrote that. It came out in like 2006 or something about that. And so it was a very long time and something made me think to, to uh, read it. And, uh, you know, it's mainly Tom talking, uh, although I, I do extend it in a few places. Uh, and he's got lots of interesting things. He has a he has a more favorable, but not totally favorable view of Rand than he has of Brandon. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, that's what happened. And then fee everything with fee changed. I don't need to go into the gory details. And uh, I spent some time uh, a year working with uh, the Future Freedom Foundation, editing. Uh, Went from F E E to F F F, working your way through the phone book. It sounds like. <laughs> Well, I just had the. I also have, to have a note to my younger people e what a phone book is. <laughs> I just had to erase the two bottom the lines on the E's. Yeah. I got FFF. It was e it was easy. Uh, my, so my shirts, I could easily change my shirts with some, you know, paint. So. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, uh, it was a privilege to publish you with the Freeman. I don't know if that was the first time you were in the Freeman, but you wrote some very good pieces for me on Nozick and for I got you to uh, kind of rewrite your your point about equality the uh, what was it the unknown the other unknown ideal I think uh, and so you you contributed I don't know three four pieces for me uh, I don't know if you ever wrote for FFF or not but uh, I don't. So that was fun for uh, doing that for a year but then that that ended they couldn't raise the money and um, and so that I was on my own for a bit scratching scratching away getting some help from a friend of mine in California I spent a year and a half in San Diego uh, at that time, I was seeing you at Liberty Fund, right? Because we had a few things. We had the yeah, and also at Appy. We two things at that San Diego. What was that Imperial Hotel or something in San Diego? The uh, was, had, the, uh, was it the, the Mall in La, La Jolla? Is that the one? Yeah, La Jolla. Oh, sort, thinking, yeah, just sort of north of San Diego. Yeah, that's, that's that's Grande. Anyway, we we where my mother Park. lived in the 1930s as a child. Yeah, you told me. I remember you told but me. Also, uh, you know, uh, also, he used to come out to the Association for Private Enterprise Education when it was in Las Vegas. Uh, I think that's when you were still working for Fee, and they were, you know, you know, they were giving you the travel funds to get out there. Oh um, yeah, I got to, the, yeah. Those that was, those were the only times I went to the Appy. That was a few times, and uh, those were great. Fun. That was great fun too. I got to yeah, you used to take us out to dinner actually, on Fee's dime. I'd be on your panel, <laughs> right? And I and I you would set up panels. I guess you would set them up and had and I was on there and I gave a couple. Of, I debated yeah, I had people uh, like uh, Gary Day and Charles Johnson and so on. How did so? I that's where I was meeting. How, did, how did you get interested in the in left libertarianism and and uh, you know, well at uh, well this is part of my Freeman legacy, which make maybe make some people cringe, because uh, actually there's one person very kind of prominent in the movement. I won't name him who twice tried to get me fired because I brought Kevin Carson to the to the Freeman. <laughs> uh, I started reading, well, I was already reading you and we were in communication and I think you made me aware that there was actually this thing, left libertarianism. Uh, I don't think I was fully aware of it, maybe not really aware of it at all. No, I had, you know, I was certainly aware of Rothbard and his new left days. So I, and, and I knew Roy Childs who had written about, uh, you know, the, the real history of big business in opposition to Rand who said it was with America's persecuted uh, major a minority. So I already had some of this, this background. It wasn't totally foreign, but I was now hearing it extended in ways I hadn't experienced and finding it very, very interesting. And it seemed consistent with the things I believed. So you, I remember email from you, I'd asked you, who should I read then in this? And you, and this is where I first, I'm sure first time I saw the name Kevin Carson. 
who I know you've had on as a guest. Uh, and then uh, Charles Johnson and uh, you might have mentioned Gary. I met, later met Gary at a yeah. Gary at a came in for my or orbit a little bit later. Uh, yeah, not to know. But him. I met him at Freedom Fest or one of those things. It was in Vegas, but I already knew him. But we met face to face at one of those. Yeah, I know he uh, used so to. I started I've reading these people. Freedom Fest. I know he used to go out, not go go out there, yeah. not not to attend the sessions, but just to to hang out with yeah. with other people who are going there. It's so a big book. Area. Like, yeah, it's a big book. Going, you. Know, you go to the crowd, not to you know, not to talk to the crowd, but to talk to individuals and draw them away from the crowd. Uh, it was Freedom Fest. Yeah, because there was a very there was a very big open uh, you know book book uh, exhibition room, mm -hmm. and it was yeah it was a lot of fun just to hang out there. I, I usually did more of that than anything else. Uh, so I started reading these people you recommended. Probably one of the earliest things I did was get my uh, get my hands on. Uh, uh, studies in uh, what is that mutualist political, mutualist economy. political economy and and devoured that and around that time you were bringing out that that uh, edition of the journal of libertarian studies which was a look at that book an examination of that book pro and con there was some pretty vicious stuff about, about the book in there uh, <laughs> yeah the funny thing about george, this, Reeson, I, george the reason Reeson. i invited george reeson to do that is because uh reeson yeah. had you know had also well as you know reeson reeson had also been doing work on how some aspects of the classical conception of cost and value could be solved yes. and reconciled with- He was a Ricardian. He was an Austrian Ricardian. Yeah, and <laughs> Parson was doing something similar. And so I thought, well, maybe there'd be some interesting, I was so wrong. <laughs> yes, you were, you were. He told, me back, he told me that back then. He told me that back then and yeah, yeah. You can't ever predict, can you? Yeah, no, uh, was... So I was, I thought it was extremely interesting stuff. And I learned a lot about history, including, including, uh, you know, Marx's take on a, on a lot of history, not, not, not so much the, the theory of economics or the yeah, no, Marx is a lot but better historical history episodes, history. like the, you know, closing up of the commons and, and denying people customary rights that they'd enjoyed for you know, a long, long time. And, yeah, and and like that. So I learned a huge amount. Which, by which, and uh, so I had him, right. Capitalist accumulation. I invited him to write for the Freeman, and he wrote something about the history of transportation subsidies and how it distorts the economy. And uh, he, what's his uh, line? The the subsidy of history. Uh, yeah. I think that that article was. Uh, I think that title was was the uh, what he used in the maybe the first article he wrote. And he also he us. also did a piece about and, taking you know Hayekian concerns about knowledge problems and central planning and applying them to the you know to these to the hierarchical corporation. Exactly, and making this very important point about vulgar libertarianism, which you know, it's one of those things that once you once you hear it's actually somebody state, say it to you, it's like, of course, that 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 doesn't sound so startling. Except you didn't really think of it, you know, in the forefront of your mind. You didn't really not all libertarians have that. Of course, reaction. And that's the <laughs> that's the idea that if, if libertarians are complaining about all the regulation and intervention by the state, including a lot of privilege by the state, why then? On the following day, when the, when a leftist is criticizing something a corporation is doing, do a lot of libertarians then say, "Hey, wait a second! If it wasn't serving consumers, they wouldn't be doing it, or competition will drive it out if it's not good." Wait a second! What were you saying yesterday about all the interventions and the the, the privileges and the excluding of competition? And it's it's a failure to think, you know, the two sides of your brain thinking about the same thing at the same time. Of so Marxists do sure the same thing in reverse. The yeah. Marxists will say, you know, all these evil things arise from free competition, you know, and then they, they give their historical story. And some of the, you know, when the capital, when the defender of capitalism says all this, uh, you know, all this came about because the capitalists were thrifty and frugal and smart and so forth. And they say, no, no, look at all this, you know, this yeah. violent in intervention. Uh, but then, you know, right. the Marxists will forget all that. Uh, and this really goes back to, to Marx himself to some extent. Uh, they'll suddenly forget all that and say, no, it's the um, uh, you know, it's it's the the market that that creates all this uh, uh, hierarchy right. and oppression and so forth. And we go, you know, so so right. there's so so the the vulgar libertarian and the vulgar Marxist have a certain um, uh, have a certain kinship, although neither would be happy to recognize it. Well, there were some people who were not happy to see Kevin's article. I don't think they knew his name, but they read the piece, and somebody wrote to uh, you know, above my pay grade and said, uh, this is the kind of thing I would expect to see in a left-wing journal. 
uh, well, that blew over. But then we started a, uh, a little writing uh, competition. Not, not, uh, when, when Beth Hoffman, the longtime managing editor, died, a donor and a board member wanted to put money in to create a Beth Hoffman Prize. So we decided to make it, okay, the best article from the previous year. So it was already published. It wasn't, in a way, a writing competition. And I picked like the five finalists. It wasn't blind, of course. These were published articles. Uh, I picked five finalists and I submitted it to a, uh, to a, a three hardcore Austrian economists. No one's going to complain about uh, they picked Kevin Carson's article on the on the transportation subsidy, so he wins that article uh, that uh, competition. And the same guy that had written like the year earlier writes again to complain. Oh, it's bad enough. He, they published the article. Now the guy wins an award for it. They, well, these were the, these were not left libertarians. They certainly wouldn't call them left libertarians who were on that jury panel who picked Dick Carson's article, and they and they knew the, the name was on there, so they would have known who it was too. But they just thought it was the best of the articles. Uh, out of the five I had nominated, and I tried to be very fair about what I thought were the best, or it was me saying it, but, but still. Uh, so that was an adventurous time. And uh, mm -hmm. since then, since the FFF gig uh, came to an end, and I spent a year and a half in San Diego, uh, living cheaply and deciding what to do, uh, Scott Horton called me up and said, let's form an institute and we'll break. Let's, let's start a, a group. Let's start an organization. And it became the Libertarian Institute. So. Interesting that no one has grabbed that name yet. Yeah, it is, it is kind of interesting. Isn't it? And so my TGI, my, you know, I've been writing this weekly column, TGIF, the, the goal is freedom, which began in 2006 at the, at the Freeman, first of all, first online, and then it would, a version of it would end up in the magazine. Uh, and then I carried it over. It always followed me. And when I didn't yeah. have a real job, it was on my own free association blog. And then when I joined FFF, it was there. And then it's at the, Libertarian uh, Institute, although I don't write it weekly. It's, it's much more occasional now. So that's my, that's my biography. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about your, your three most recent books. So uh, starting with America's Counter Revolution, The Constitution Revisited, uh, which I think may be the context in which I discovered this quote. Um, yes, I found that. I, bit about that. I, found, I don't remember why I found it. I don't remember a lot. Of, I don't remember a lot about Abraham Bishop. I think he's from Connecticut. Uh, he might have been in Congress. You know, I, I really didn't know much about him, and I didn't try to, you know, do some research to find out a lot. About I looked him. a little bit about him. It turns out he was, he was one of the few founders who, when the Haitian Revolution broke out, was was expressing sympathy for the black slave rebels as opposed to, you know, clutching pearls about the. Uh, the the fate of oh. the slave owners' property. So he he was a he was a, a better Jeffersonian than Jefferson, um, and he was pretty oh, good. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Too. He was uh, um, he had some stuff on uh, on the separation of church and state. He had some uh, anti imperialist stuff. He was not terrific, but better than average for his time on. On gender equality, uh, he, he was a defender of um, of uh, of um, education for women and so forth. So it was, you know, we, as the as the founders go, he seems to have been one of the one of the cooler ones. Well, I found that uh, you know either in a book by Gordon Wood, who was you know who was a great historian of the revolutionary period, the constitutional period, or one of the writers about the Anti-Federalists. I, I really don't remember now. Uh, there aren't footnotes in that book, so I can't, I can't check, check it. I guess I probably have notes somewhere, private notes. But when I saw that, you know, Trump was was getting his campaign together. He might have even announced by then. That was in 2015 that he announced, right? And when I saw that, I mean, I don't know if pe people got a chance to see the quote. I don't know if you held it up long enough. Well, I, sure, but well it, what it but says is, about the, a nation yeah, makes greatness its pole star can never be free. Abraham was, was 1800. I was blown out of my chair. Because Trump was in the air, it was make America great again. You could imagine my delight. Talk about serendipity. Uh, I couldn't have made up a better quotation. It was just fantastic. So, uh, did well, I put course, that in yeah, well, as I said, the you know the the progressive left is not exactly free from the cult of national greatness either. Yeah, so you true. can take it as an anti quote as well. And the and the neocons, 
were all about national yeah. greatness. War was a path to national greatness. It gave people a sense of purpose. Well, there's a great quote from, great in some sense, quote from Herbert Crowley, uh, the defending uh, you know, American uh, warfare, saying, America needs the tonic of a serious moral adventure. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> I've got a better moral, you know, why not withdrawing from all that crap? That would be a serious moral adventure. I'd be, <laughs> I'd be done for that adventure. <laughs> exactly. So that book, that book was written over many years, actually. I mean, I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write a book. For the Freeman, I began to, I don't know why I initially got interested in this. I really don't remember. Uh, I started writing essays, uh, but TJFs, they began as the TGIF columns which I then maybe probably expanded and, and put in the magazine uh, about the constitution. I wish I could remember what triggered this uh, because I, look, I, was, I had been an anarchist for since 1969. So it wasn't like news to me that there was a problem with the constitution. Yeah. Although there are a lot of what, anarchists who still have a kind of, yeah, you know, who still but I, keep invoking the constitution more often than you would expect. But I wasn't, I wasn't cited, I wasn't on a con, even that kind of constitutionalist. I just wasn't. And so, but in something, for some reason, in, I started that column in 2006, uh, something I read got me interested in this. And I just started reading Merle Jensen, great, a great historian of the period of the Articles of Confederation. And, 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 then, and then, the you know, uh, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Maybe, maybe something about the Articles of Confederation really kicked this off. And I read something and said, wow, they don't have, they didn't have the power to tax or regulate trade. Of course, they Rothbard's discover... book on this is finally out now, although I haven't yes. had a chance to read right. it. The, the final volume quickly. of Conceived in Liberty, which for a long time was, you right. know, it was either in Just... unreadable uh, uh, handwriting or Yes. In audible tapes, and now they finally, they think they finally That's reconstructed true. it. And, and I think the notes, I think the editor actually had to do a lot of reconstructing, right? Jeff Hummel is very, thinks that's a very good book. He had a review in Reason magazine. Uh, he likes that. And I look a lot. forward to reading that when I get a chance. Uh, when, anyway, f uh, however it got, my interest got uh, going. Uh, I just was reading stuff. I think I was reading about the Articles of Confederation uh, and began writing about that. I mean, those might have been the earliest ones. I really don't remember uh, about how uh, this is amazing. Here's a quote government, it's more like a quasi government really. It had no power to tax and it had no power to regulate trade. It had to go hat in hand to the states. The states would say the checks in the mail, you know, get out of here sometimes. Uh, and uh, I just thought that was an extremely interesting chapter in American history, which doesn't get much, much uh, attention. It's kind of like because, what taxation uh, used to be in the Middle Ages, where the, the kings had to ask the you know, yeah. local, uh, uh, right. municipalities and jurisdictions for uh, tax contributions, which they might or might not end up right. offering up. And that, or the rise actually, of that drew me into the, you know, the move toward a constitution, which was to, quote, fix, right, fix these flaws, namely the lack of taxation power and the lack of, uh, and the other, other things, including uh, the power to regulate trade, we, that had to be fixed. It was a big problem, right? Because what kind of government, what kind of self-respecting government lacks those two powers? It's crazy. Uh, so that drew me to the Constitutional Convention. And, and so I started reading stuff. Uh, Jensen talked about both. And Jensen has a great line, which I quote, where he says, the, the men that wrote the Constitution were very different from the men who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And that really flicked on a light. And I just kept reading from there and started doing these, Essays, which when I look back, I'm a little amazed that here I am the editor of the Freeman and I'm writing the subversive, the, you know, the Freeman was never really a edgy radical uh, magazine or fee was not edgy and radical, right? Uh, but here I'm writing, I'm questioning the constitution, not just once, a series of articles. Uh, and uh, I remember one of the presidents, I will go nameless, said to me, I see you're writing a lot about the constitution. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, you know, every people really does need its folklore, its fairy tales. And luckily that wasn't an order to stop cease and desist because I didn't, I didn't cease and desist and nothing happened to me. <laughs> so I guess, uh, I guess it uh, wasn't meant that way. Uh, eventually in uh, 2015, when I was in California and, and didn't have an actual job, uh, I think it was Gary Chartier who came to me and said, uh, why don't you just put all that stuff together in a book? Funny, it never occurred to me. 
uh, I didn't think it was all that weighty, although looking back on it, I guess it's pretty good. But uh, Well, you can uh, tell his, uh, his contribution both from the choice of publisher and from the, the font choices on the cover. <laughs> For yeah. those familiar right. with Gary, the, both of those sort of scream Gary. We published it under, uh, yeah, that, uh, that uh, publishing house. Good and, uh, and I'll never forget when I had a PDF of it or when maybe when I had the actual book in my hand, I said, this is amazing because I actually have a book on the Constitution. And uh, so uh, I, feel, I feel proud of that book. I mean, I think it's a good solid book. And, I, and you inspired at least one of the chapters in there. The, one of the late, the, I think the last chapter is called The Constitution of Anarchy because I, I learned a lot from an essay you wrote, you'll remember the title, I don't, about how Mark and any society has- probably, or something like that. Yeah, any society it, it, it has a constitution. Not. I mean, there was, a, I had a blog, a series of blog posts when I was debating Robert Beninato, the sort of along those lines, but also- Yes, oh, I great, had, great uh, you know, but I had a, I had a chapter in um, the anthology that I did with Tibor McCann on- uh, Yes, that's exactly right. And I had read that and, and mine, mine, I mean, it's not a ripoff because your name is all through that chapter. <laughs> and I quote it quite a bit, but it was such an important point. I, I'm glad I was able to kind of uh, lift a Hayekian title, right? He's got the Constitution of Liberty. I just thought this is has to be called the Constitution of Anarchy. Mm -hmm. And because it's so counterintuitive, how can an anarchist society have a constitution? Well, any society, qua society, has a constitution, a set of, a set of rules, tacit, sometimes tacit, sometimes not tacit, that constitute that society, regu the regularity, the customs, the etiquette, you know, all those things, all those things that the- As I always like to say, have to be competition is a form of checks and balances. And so exactly. anarchy has, you know, more competition than a monopolistic system. So of course, a monopolistic system that has division of powers like the US, or, you know, division of powers between the three branches between the federal government and the states, that has more competition than like a you know, solid unified monolithic authoritarian state does um yeah. you know and the more you know, the more competition it has the, you know, the better it works in checks and balances and uh you know anarchy is free entry into the job of checks and balances which makes it harder for the checks and balance checkers and balancers to end up sort of polluting because yeah anyone can no, it's a it's a brilliant it's a brilliant paper i thank you for it because it inspired my chapter which then made i think the perfect closing chapter to, to my book on the constitution uh, I was so happy when it occurred to me, okay, that's not about the U.S. Constitution, but that belongs in this book. <laughs> so it's the final chapter. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm proud of that book. It was like, you know, 20 years in the making, let's say. Yeah, it's an excellent book. 15 years. Uh, Boo! Which actually means this in Turkish. I think Uzbek also. So all those ghosts have just been saying this, this, this all the time. Anyway, um, I'm interrupting here because uh, my full interview with Sheldon ends up running for nearly two and a half hours, which is both a, you know, a heavy burden on my viewers and a heavy burden, burden on my bandwidth when I try to upload it. Uh, so I'm going to be snipping this, uh, this interview in half, and this seems like a good place to snip. Um, a natural, it's, a, it's, a, it's roughly halfway through, and it's a, um, it's almost exactly halfway through, really. Um, and just, you know, and it's sort of a natural transition from one, you know, from talking about one topic to the next. Um, and so I'm going to uh, uh, um, load the first half of this, uh, this interview this week, and I will load the second half next week. Although I don't know when you're seeing this, you might be you might be binge watching uh, at some point in the future when they're both up. Maybe you're binge watching all my episodes at the time when uh, when they're all up. Maybe all of them are up in the sense of all ever, and that you know, I'm dead and you're just watching what's left. Um, that took a dark turn. Anyway, uh, so. Uh, well, it started off with ghosts, so what do you expect? Boo, again, this, this, this. Anyway, um, uh, so, uh, you know, if you're watching this, you know, right after I upload it, then uh, you, you'll have to wait eagerly for a week or so for, um, for part two, which uh, uh, 
uh, is uh, it's going to be very interesting as well. And uh, in the meantime, like, share, subscribe. You know you want to. And if you feel like you know, supporting this channel on uh, PayPal or Patreon, you know I can't you know command that with quite as peremptory a wave since uh, you know that's not as costless as the other options. Um, but I just mentioned it as you know, something you might just feel like doing. If you suddenly find yourself with loads of extra money in your hands, you don't know what to do with it. Um, uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, farewell until uh, next time.